chapters twenty seven through twenty nine of foul play by charles reed and dion boucicault this librivox recording is in the public domain twenty seven the perplexity into which hazel was thrown by the outburst of his companion rendered him unable to reduce her demand at once to an intelligible form for some moments he seriously employed his mind on the problem until it assumed this shape firstly i do not know where the island is having no means of ascertaining either its latitude or longitude secondly if i had such a description of its locality how might the news be conveyed beyond the limits of the place as the wildness of helen's demand broke upon his mind he smiled sadly and sat down upon the bank of the little river near his boat-house and buried his head in his hands a deep groan burst from him and the tears at last came through his fingers as in despair he thought how vain must be any effort to content or to conciliate her impatient with his own weakness he started to his feet when a hand was laid gently upon his arm she stood beside him mr hazel she said hurriedly her voice was husky do not mind what i have said i am unreasonable and i am sure i ought to feel obliged to you for all the hazel turned his face toward her and the moon glistened on the tears that still flowed down his cheeks he tried to check the utterance of her apology but ere he could master his voice the girl's cold and constrained features seemed to melt she turned away wrung her hands and with a sharp quivering cry she broke forth oh sir oh mr hazel do forgive me i am not ungrateful indeed indeed i am not but i am mad with despair judge me with compassion at this moment those who are very dear very dear to me are awaiting my arrival in london and when they learn the loss of the proserpine how great will be their misery well that misery is added to mine then my poor papa he will never know how much he loved me until this news reaches him and to think that i am dead to them yet living living here helplessly helplessly dear dear arthur how you will suffer for my sake oh papa papa shall i never see you again and she wept bitterly i am helpless to aid or to console you miss rolleston by the act of a divine providence you were cast upon this desolate shore and by the same will i was appointed to serve and to provide for your welfare i pray god that he will give me the health and strength to assist you good night she looked timidly at him for a moment then slowly regained her hut he had spoken coldly and with dignity she felt humbled the more so that he had only bowed his acknowledgment to her apology for more than an hour she watched him as he paced up and down between the boat-house and the shore then he advanced a little toward her shelter and she shrank into her bed after gently closing the door in a few moments she crept again to peep forth and to see if he was still there but he had disappeared the following morning helen was surprised to see the boat riding at anchor in the surf and hazel busily engaged on her trim he was soon on shore and by her side i am afraid i must leave you for a day miss rolleston he said i wish to make a circuit of the island indeed i ought to have done so many days ago is such an expedition necessary surely you have had enough of the sea it is very necessary you have urged me to undertake this enterprise you see it is the first step toward announcing to all passing vessels our presence in this place i have commenced operations already see on yonder bluff which i have called telegraph point i have mounted the boat's ensign and now it floats from the top of the tree beside the bonfire i carried it there at sunrise do you see that pole i have shipped on board the boat that is intended as a signal which shall be exhibited on your great palm tree the flag will then stand for a signal on the northern coast and the palm tree thus accoutred will serve for a similar purpose on the western extremity of the island as i pass along the southern and eastern shores i propose to select spots where some mark can be erected such as may be visible to ships at sea but will they remark such signals be assured they will if they come within sight of the place hazel knew that there was little chance of such an event 
but it was something not to be neglected he also explained that it was necessary he should arrive at a knowledge of the island the character of its shores and from the sea he could rapidly obtain a plan of the place ascertain what small rivers there might be and indeed see much of its interior for he judged it to not be more than ten miles in length and scarce three in width helen felt rather disappointed that no trace of the emotion he displayed on the previous night remained in his manner or in the expression of his face she bowed her permission to him rather haughtily and sat down to breakfast on some baked yams and some rough oysters which he had raked up from the bay while bathing that morning the young man had regained an elasticity of hearing an independence of tone to which she was not at all accustomed his manners were always soft and deferential but his expression was more firm and she felt that the reins had been gently removed from her possession and there was a will to guide her which she was bound to acknowledge and obey she did not argue in this wise for it is not human to reason and to feel at the same moment she felt then instinctively that the man was quietly asserting his superiority and the child pouted hazel went about his work briskly the boat was soon laden with every requisite helen watched these preparations askance vexed with the expedition which she had urged him to make then she fell to reflecting on the change that seemed to have taken place in her character she who was once so womanly so firm so reasonable why had she become so petulant childish and capricious the sail was set and all ready to run the cutter into the surf of the rising tide when taking a sudden resolution as it were helen came rapidly down and said i will go with you if you please half in command and half in doubt hazel looked a little surprised but very pleased and then she added i hope i shall not be in your way he assured her on the contrary that she might be of great assistance to him and now with double alacrity he ran out the little vessel and leaped into the prow as she danced over the waves he taught her how to bring the boat's head round with the help of an oar and when all was snug left her at the helm on reaching the mouth of the bay if it could be so called he made her remark that it was closed by reefs except to the north and to the west the wind being southerly he had decided to pass to the west and so they opened the sea about half a mile from the shore for about three miles they perceived it consisted of a line of bluffs cleft at intervals by small narrow bays the precipitous sides of which were lined with dense foliage into these fissures the sea entered with a mournful sound that died away as it crept up the yellow sands with which these nooks were carpeted an exclamation from helen attracted his attention to the horizon on the northwest where a long line of breakers glittered in the sun a reef or low sandy bay appeared to exist in that direction about fifteen miles away and something more than a mile in length as they proceeded he marked roughly on the side of his tin baler with the point of a pin borrowed from helen the form of the coastline an hour and a half brought them to the northwestern extremity of the island as they cleared the shelter of the land the southerly breeze coming with some force across the open sea caught the cutter and she lay over in a way to inspire helen with alarm she was about to let go the tiller when hazel seized it accidentally enclosing her hand under the grasp of his own as he pressed the tiller hard to port steady please don't relinquish your hold it is all right no fear he cried as he kept his eye on their sail he held this course for a mile or more and then judging with a long tack he could weather the southerly side of the island he put the boat about he took occasion to explain to helen how this operation was necessary and she learned the alphabet of navigation the western end of their little land now lay before them it was about three miles in breadth for two miles the bluff coastline continued unbroken then a deep bay a mile in width and two miles in depth was made by a long tongue of sand projecting westerly on its extremity grew the gigantic palm well recognized as helen's landmark hazel stood up in the boat to reconnoitre the coast he perceived the sandy shore was dotted with multitudes of dark objects ere long these objects were seen to be in motion and pointing them out to helen with a smile he said beware miss rolleston yonder are your bugbears and in some force too those dark masses moving upon the hillocks of sand or rolling on the surf are sea-lions the phoca leonina or lion-seal 
ellen strained her eyes to distinguish the forms but only descried the dingy objects while thus engaged she allowed the cutter to fall off a little and ere hazel had resumed his hold upon the tiller they were fairly in the bay the great palm-tree on their starboard bow you seem determined to make the acquaintance of your nightmares he remarked you perceive that we are embayed her consternation amused him she saw that if they held their present course the cutter would take the beach about a mile ahead where these animals were densely crowded at this moment something dark bulged up close beside her in the sea and the rounded back of a monster rolled over and disappeared hazel let drop the sail for they were now fairly in the smooth water of the bay and close to the sandy pit the gigantic stem of the palm-tree was on their quarter about a half mile off he took the oars and rowed slowly toward the shore a small seal rose behind the boat and followed them playing with the blade its gambols resembling that of a kitten he pointed out to helen the mild expression of the creature's face and assured her that all this tribe were harmless animals and susceptible of domestication the cub swam up to the boat quite fearlessly and he touched its head gently he encouraged her to do the like but she shrank from its contact they were now close ashore and hazel throwing out his anchor in two feet of water prepared to land the beam of wood he had brought to decorate the palm-tree as a signal the huge stick was soon heaved overboard and he leapt after it he towed it to the nearest landing to the tree and dragged it high up on the shore scarcely had he disposed it conveniently intending to return in a day or two with the means of affixing it in a prominent and remarkable manner in the form of a spar across the trunk of the palm when a cry from helen recalled him a large number of the sea lions were coasting quietly down the surf toward the boat indeed a dozen of them had made their appearance around it hazel shouted to her not to fear and desiring that her alarm should not spread to the swarm he passed back quietly but rapidly when he reached the water three or four of the animals were already floundering between him and the boat he waded slowly toward one of them and stood beside it the man and the creature looked quietly at each other and then the seal rolled over with a snuffling self-satisfied air winking its soft eyes with immense complacency helen in her alarm could not resist a smile at this conclusion of so terrible a demonstration for with all their gentle expression the tusks of the brute looked formidable but when she saw hazel pushing them aside and patting a very small cub on the back she recovered her courage completely then he took his oars again and aided by the tide which was now on the ebb he rowed round the southwestern extremity of the island he found the water here as he anticipated very shallow it was midday when they were fairly on the southern coast and now sailing with the wind aft the cutter ran through the water at racing speed fearing that some reefs or rocky formations might exist in their course he reduced sail and kept away from the shore about a mile at this distance he was better able to see inland and mark down the accident of its formation the southern coast was uniform and helen said it resembled the cliffs of the kentish or sussex coast of england only the english white was here replaced by the pale volcanic grey by one o'clock they came abreast the very spot where they had first made land and as they judged due south of their residence had they landed here a walk of three miles across the centre of the island would have brought them home for about a similar distance the coast exhibited monotonous cliffs unbroken even by a rill it was plain that the watershed of the island was all northward they now approached the eastern end where rose the circular mountain of which mention has been already made this eminence had evidently at one time been detached from the rest of the land to which it was now joined by a neck of swamp about a mile and a half in breadth and two miles in length hazel proposed to reconnoitre this part of the shore nearly and ran the boat close in to land the reeds or canes with which this bog was densely clothed grew in a dark spongy soil here and there this waste was dotted with ragged trees which he recognised as the cypress from its gaunt branches hung a black funeral kind of weeper a kind of moss resembling iron-grey horsehair both in texture and uses though not so long in the staple this parasite hazel explained to helen was very common in such marshy ground 
and was the death flag hung out by nature to warn man that malaria and fever were the invisible and inalienable inhabitants of that fatal neighbourhood looking narrowly along the low shore for some good landing where under shelter of a tree they might repose for an hour and spread their midday repast they discovered an opening in the reeds a kind of lagoon or bayou extending into the morass between the highlands of the island and the circular mountain but close under the base of the latter this inlet he proposed to explore and accordingly the sail was taken down and the cutter was poled into the narrow creek the water here was so shallow that the keel slid over the quicksand into which the oar sank freely the creek soon became narrow the water deeper and of a blacker colour and the banks more densely covered with canes these grew to the height of ten and twelve feet and as close as wheat in the thick crop the air felt dank and heavy and hummed with myriads of insects the black water became so deep and the bottom so sticky that hazel took to the oars again the creek narrowed as they proceeded until it proved scarcely wide enough to admit of his working the boat the height of the reeds hindered the view on either side suddenly however and after proceeding very slowly through the bends of the canal they decreased in height and density and they emerged into an open space of about five acres in extent a kind of oasis in this reedy desert created by a mossy mound which arose amid the morass and afforded firm footing of which a grove of trees and innumerable shrubs availed themselves helen uttered an exclamation of delight as this island of foliage in a sea of reeds met her eyes that had been famished with the arid monotony of the break they soon landed helen insisted on the preparations for their meal being left to her and having selected a sheltered spot she was soon busy with their frugal food hazel surveyed the spot and selecting a red cedar was soon seated forty feet above her head making a topographical survey of the neighbourhood he found that the bayou by which they had entered continued its course to the northern shore thus cutting off the mountain or easterly end and forming of it a separate island he saw that a quarter of a mile farther on the bayou or canal parted forming two streams of which that to the left seemed the main channel this he determined to follow turning to the west that is toward their home he saw at a distance of two miles a crest of hills broken into cliffs which defined the limit of the mainland the sea had at one time occupied the site where the morass now stood these cliffs formed a range extending from north to south their precipitous sides clothed here and there with trees marked where the descent was broken by platforms between him and this range the morass extended hazel took note of three places where the descent from these hills into the marsh could he believed most readily be made on the eastern side and close above him arose the peculiar mountain its form was that of a truncated cone and its sides densely covered with trees of some size the voice of helen called him from his perch and he descended quickly leaping into a mass of brushwood growing at the foot of his tree helen stood a few yards from him in admiration before a large shrub look mr hazel what a singular production said the girl as she stooped to examine the plant it bore a number of red flowers each growing out of a fruit like a prickly pear these flowers were in various stages some were just opening like tulips others more advanced had expanded like umbrellas and quite overlapped the fruit keeping it from sun and dew others had served their turn in that way and been withered by the sun's rays but wherever this was the case the fruit had also burst open and displayed or discharged its contents and those contents looked like seeds but on narrower inspection proved to be little insects with pink transparent wings and bodies of incredibly vivid crimson hazel examined the fruit and flowers very carefully and stood rapt transfixed it must be and it is said he at last well i'm glad i've not died without seeing it what is it said she one of the most valuable productions of the earth it is cochineal this is the tunal tree oh indeed said helen indifferently cochineal is used for a dye but as it is not probable we shall require to dye anything the discovery seems to be more curious than useful you wanted some ink this pigment mixed with lime-juice will form a beautiful red ink 
will you lend me your handkerchief and permit me to try if i have forgotten the method by which these little insects are obtained he asked her to hold her handkerchief under a bough of the tunal tree where the fruit was ripe he then shook the bough some insects fell at once into the cloth a great number rose and buzzed a little in the sun not a yard from where they were born but the sun dried their blood so promptly that they soon fell dead in the handkerchief those that the sun so killed went through three phases of colour before their eyes they fell down black or nearly they whitened on the cloth and after that came gradually to their final colour a flaming crimson the insect thus treated appeared the most vivid of all they soon secured about half a teacup full they were rolled up and put away then they sat down and made a very hearty meal for it was now past two o'clock they re-entered the boat and passing once more into the morass they found the channel of the bayou as it approached the northern shore less difficult of navigation the bottom became sandy and hard and the presence of trees in the swamp proved that spots of terra firma were more frequent but the water shallowed and as they opened the shore he saw with great vexation that the tide in receding had left the bar at the mouth of the canal visible in some parts he pushed on however until the boat grounded this was a sad affair there lay the sea not fifty yards ahead hazel leaped out and examined and forded the channel which at this place was about two hundred feet wide he found a narrow passage near the eastern side and to this he towed the boat then he begged miss rolleston to land and relieved the boat of the mast sail and oars thus lightened he dragged her into the passage but the time occupied in these preparations had been also occupied by nature the tide had receded and the cutter stuck immovably in the waterway about six fathoms short of deeper water what is to be done now inquired helen when hazel returned to her side panting but cheerful we must await the rising of the tide i fear we are imprisoned here for three hours at least there was no help for it helen made light of the misfortune the spot where they had landed was enclosed between the two issues of the lagoon they walked along the shore to the more easterly and the narrower canal and on arriving hazel found to his great annoyance that there was ample water to have floated the cutter had he selected that the least promising road he suggested a return by the road they came and passing into the other canal by that to reach the sea they hurried back but found by this time the tide had left the cutter high and dry on the sand so they had no choice but to wait having three hours to spare hazel asked miss rolleston's permission to ascend the mountain she assented to remain near the boat while he was engaged in this expedition the ascent was too rugged and steep for her powers and the seashore and adjacent groves would find her ample amusement during his absence she accompanied him to the bank of the smaller lagoon which he forded and waving an adieu to her he plunged into the dense wood with which the sides of the mountain were clothed she waited some time and then she heard his voice shouting to her from the heights above the mountain top was about three-quarters of a mile from where she stood but seemed much nearer she turned back toward the boat walking slowly but paused as a faint and distant cry again reached her ear it was not repeated and then she entered the grove the ground beneath her feet was soft with velvety moss and the dark foliage of the trees rendered the air cool and deliciously fragrant after wandering for some time she regained the edge of the grove near the boat and selecting a spot at the foot of an aged cypress she sat down with her back against its trunk then she took out arthur's letter and began to read those impassioned sentences as she read she sighed deeply as earnestly she found herself pitying arthur's condition more than she regretted her own she fell into reverie and from reverie into a drowsy languor how long she remained in this state she could not remember but a slight rustle overhead recalled her senses believing it to be a bird moving in the branches she was resigning herself again to rest when she became sensible of a strange emotion a conviction that something was watching her with a fixed gaze she cast her eyes around but saw nothing she looked upward from the tree immediately above her lap depended a snake its tail coiled around a dead branch the reptile hung straight its eyes fixed like two rubies upon helen's as very slowly it let itself down by its uncoiling tail 
now its head was on a level with hers in another moment it must drop into her lap she was paralyzed twenty eight after toiling up a rugged and steep ascent encumbered with blocks of grey stone of which the island seemed to be formed forcing his way over fallen trees and through the tangled undergrowth of a species of wild vine which abounded on the mountain-side hazel stopped to breathe and peer around as well as the dense foliage permitted he was up to his waist in scrub and the stiff leaves of the bayonet plant rendered caution necessary in walking at moments through the dense foliage he caught a glisten of the sea the sun was in the north behind him and by this alone he guided his road due southerly and upward once only he found a small cleared space about an acre in extent and here it was he uttered the cry helen heard he waited a few moments in the hope to hear her voice in reply but it did not reach him again he plunged upward and now the ascent became at times so arduous that more than once he almost resolved to relinquish or at least to defer his task but a moment's rest recalled him to himself and he was not one easily baffled by difficulty or labour so he toiled on until he judged the summit ought to have been reached after pausing to take breath and counsel he fancied that he had borne too much to the left the ground to his right appeared to rise more than the path that he was pursuing which had become level and he concluded that instead of ascending he was circling the mountain top he turned aside therefore and after ten minutes hard climbing he was pushing through a thick and high scrub when the earth seemed to give way beneath him and he fell into an abyss he was engulfed he fell from bush to bush down down scratch rip plump until he lodged in a prickly bush more winded than hurt out of this he crawled only to discover himself thus landed in a great and perfectly circular plain of about thirty acres in extent or about three hundred and fifty yards in diameter in the centre was a lake also circular the broad belt of shore around this lake was covered with rich grass level as a bowling green and all this again was surrounded by a nearly perpendicular cliff down which indeed he had fallen this cliff was thickly clothed with shrubs and trees hazel recognized the crater of an extinct volcano on examining the lake he found the waters impregnated with volcanic products its bottom was formed of asphaltum having made a circuit of the shores he perceived on the westerly side that next the island a break in the cliff and on a narrow examination he discovered an outlet it appeared to him that the lake at one time had emptied its waters through this ancient watercourse the descent here was not only gradual but the old river-bed was tolerably free from obstructions especially of the vegetable kind he made his way rapidly downward and in half an hour reached marshy ground the cane brake now lay before him on his left he saw the sea on the south about a third of a mile he knew that to the right must be the sea on the north about half a mile or so he bent his way thither the edge of the swamp was very clear and though somewhat spongy afforded good walking unimpeded as he approached the spot where he judged the boat to be the underwood thickened the trees again interlaced their arms and he had to struggle through the foliage at length he struck the smaller lagoon and as he was not certain whether it was fordable he followed its course to the shore where he had previously crossed in a few moments he reached the boat and was pleased to find her afloat the rising tide had even moved her a few feet back into the canal hazel shouted to apprise miss rolleston of his return and then proceeded to restore the mast to its place and replace the rigging and the oars this occupied some little time he felt surprised that she had not appeared he shouted again no reply twenty nine hazel advanced hurriedly into the grove which he hunted thoroughly but without effect he satisfied himself that she could not have quitted the spot since the marsh enclosed it on one side the canals on the second and third the sea on the fourth he returned to the boat more surprised than anxious he waited a while and again shouted her name stopped listened no answer yet surely helen could not have been more than a hundred yards from where he stood his heart beat with a strange sense of apprehension he heard nothing but the rustling of the foliage and the sop of the waves on the shore as the tide crept up the shingle 
as his eyes roved in every direction he caught sight of something white near the foot of a withered cypress tree not fifty yards from where he stood he approached the bushes in which the tree was partially concealed on that side and quickly recognized a portion of helen's dress he ran toward her burst through the underwood and gained the enclosure she was sitting there asleep as he conjectured her back leaning against the trunk he contemplated her thus for one moment and then he advanced about to awaken her but was struck speechless her face was ashy pale her eyes open and widely distended her bosom heaved slowly hazel approached rapidly and called to her her eyes never moved not a limb stirred she sat glaring forward on her lap was coiled a snake gray mottled with muddy green hazel looked round and selected a branch of the dead tree about three feet in length armed with this he advanced slowly to the reptile it was very quiet thanks to the warmth of her lap he pointed the stick at it the vermin lifted its head and its tail began to quiver then it darted at the stick throwing itself its entire length hazel retreated the snake coiled again and again darted by repeating this process four or five times he enticed the creature away and then availing himself of a moment before it could recoil he struck it a smart blow on the neck when hazel returned to miss rolleston he found her still fixed in the attitude into which terror had transfixed her the poor girl had remained motionless for an hour under the terrible fascination of the reptile comatized he spoke to her but a quick spasmodic action of her throat and a quivering of her hands alone responded the sight of her suffering agonized him beyond expression but he took her hands he pressed them for they were icy cold he called piteously on her name but she seemed incapable of effort then stooping he raised her tenderly in his arms and carried her to the boat where he laid her still unresisting and incapable with trembling limbs and weak hands he launched the cutter and they were once more afloat and bound homeward he dipped the baler into the fresh water he had brought with him for their daily supply and dashed it on her forehead this he repeated until he perceived her breathing became less painful and more rapid then he raised her a little and her head rested upon his arm when they reached the entrance of the bay he was obliged to pass it for the wind being still southerly he could not enter by the north gate but came round and ran in by the western passage the same by which they had left the same morning hazel bent over helen and whispered tenderly that they were at home she answered by a sob in half an hour the keel grated on the sand near the boat-house then he asked her if she were strong enough to reach her hut she raised her head but she felt dizzy he helped her to land all power had forsaken her limbs her head sank on his shoulder and his arm wound round her lithe figure alone prevented her falling helplessly at his feet again he raised her in his arms and bore her to the hut here he laid her down on her bed and stood for a moment beside her unable to restrain his tears End of chapters twenty seven through twenty nine